All right, so we're going to, like I said, we're going to get you access to Cisco, and everyone of us will have access before we go today. But let's start with the first module, networking today. So today, this module is going to give you a summary of the whole Cisco course, really. Uh, today, in this, this module, there's uh, not much you need to take out of it except for where we're going because it's going to give you a whole heap of ideas and, and it's not going to talk too deeply in about any, any of them. And you're probably going, oh, that's not enough information for me to use that. But just remember that we're going to go through in more in depth some of the more uh, important modules week by week. So in a couple of weeks time when we talk about the numbering system, we're going to spend a lot of time on the numbering systems, whereas today we might just flash by. Okay, so just remember that. So today, like I said, we're going to give you a bit of a broad overview of networking and topologies, internet connections, reliable networks, and some of the trends in security. <laughs> and with each of these topics, there's probably a million things we can talk about within it, but today is a bit of an overview. So first of all, I mentioned Packet Tracer. Okay, That is a piece of software that you guys will, will, will love because because it's going to mean that you don't have to buy those devices that we have that we I was showing you guys. So let me just uh, pull this over here. All right, so let me log in. So w once you get your access to your Cisco, you'll you'll be you'll ha use your Cisco login for this device, uh, this software. And and if you're wondering what's happening, it's just requiring me to log in on the other screen. OK, this is what's called Packet Tracer. You can see instead of having physical routers and switches that I sort of pointed out just before, we have routers here. Okay, let's pick one out. Let's let's uh, pick this one. We have switches. Let's pick this one out. And we have PCs. And we even have uh, servers. And we have numerous other devices as well. We could, we could, we even have, I believe, uh, we even have wireless switches somewhere, somewhere in here. I can't, I can't find it right this second. But so basically, instead of you having physical equipment like this, we can actually use this simulation. Okay, if, if you can't see clearly, especially at the back, uh, my screen up here, it's not the best. Uh, like I said, you can always join the collaborate session, which is that online session. And then I'm sharing my screen, and you'll be able to see wherever I'm showing up, doing on my screen, on your screen. So, especially you guys at the back, you can't see my projector well. Uh, do that. Okay. So, I'm going to leave it to your discretion to do that or not. But uh, obviously, yeah, help yourself. So with these devices, I can use a cable tool. It, so you got the different type of cable, and you can actually hover above the type of cable it is. And then we'll learn more about the different types of cables, like straight through, crossover, console. Uh, yeah, what's this one? Automatically, we've got serial cables and so forth. But let's actually just choose a straight through cable. This is your typical Ethernet cable that you see hanging up on the walls and behind your computers. We click on the PC. You can see there's a Ethernet port. Okay, so that's equivalent to the Ethernet port where your your cables are plugged into at the back of your computer, and then we plug it onto the switch, which is the device with all the little Ethernet ports on it. It's like a, it's almost like a power board of sorts where you can connect lots of things to the same network or same power network for power board, but in this case, the same physical network. So. At home, you might have ADSL router or MBN router, and most routers have probably five ports at the back. So that those five ports are part of a switch that's built into your router. So your router is actually two things. 
it's a router and it's a switch. So those five ports are the switch part of it. And if you plug into that router, then you're on the same physical network. If you, uh, it, we can also replace a switch with an access point because once we join that Wi-Fi network, we are part of the same network. So if I choose this, you can see there's a whole heap of Ethernet ports. Some of them are gigabit, some of them are fast Ethernet. And obviously, if you don't realize what's the difference, gigabit is 1,000 megabits per second. Ethernet is 100 megabit. Fast Ethernet is 100 megabits per second. And Ethernet is 10 megabits per second. So networking has been around for quite a while. And Cisco has been around all that time. So they've had devices which cater for all of those speeds. And to differentiate them, uh, they've got these naming for the types of ports. OK, so you you might see some devices with, with even just Ethernet, which is a 10 megabit. Don't think that these are so old that it's not relevant. It, the speed is not relevant in this packet tracer because it doesn't matter if you have a gigabit or Ethernet, they're going to work pretty much the same in this simulation. In real life, big difference in speed. But in this simulation, not going to make a huge difference. But generally, we use the fast Ethernet, 100 megabits per second for PC connections. And then we might use the gigabit for backbone connections, the faster ones. Backbone is where we're connecting the main devices on the network, whereas these access point access connections are for individual devices. So I might just, uh, with this router, let me just uh, click on it. <coughs> We'll zoom in. You can see the physical router. So this is the front. But most of what happens on a router happens at the back. I can see this is equivalent to what I, you'll be able to see on the physical devices. These are the physical ports. And right now it's on. I'm going to turn it off. Actually, I don't need to turn it off for today's. I'll, I might just turn it off. And then we can actually have additional device see you got see these holes they're just like these devices with these plates in there you see these black plates i could actually take them off and insert a new module to expand the capabilities of that router okay in just like in real life we can actually um sorry let me just find the right one I can plug in a new module just like I could do on there. I, obviously, in real life, you go purchase it, you get a piece of hardware, you take the cover off, and you insert it in. It's a bit like upgrading a network card on your computer, if you've ever done that. I might just remove that and put in, uh, I might put in uh, some serial connections. All right, that's a serial connection. And you're probably wondering, how do, I, how, do you, how do we even know these kind of connections? That's part of the course, okay? Right now, like I said, don't need to know everything. Just know that what's the point of this packet tracer? This packet tracer is, uh, is meant to connect, uh, simulate these devices so you can actually configure and practice how to do these things without having to be on there, having these devices on your home. So I might plug in the switch to the gigabit here zero okay because this is this is what we consider the backbone now the where it's a device to device connection rather than uh, a a sort of a, a user device these are intermediary devices and if we connect those up and if we connect this up to here all right the server I might use the fast Ethernet to fast Ethernet. And if we look at the PC, I'm not, this is not a, definitely I'm not going to show you everything there is to do about Packet Tracer. This is just a demo of some of the things we can do. If we look at the desktop, we can see that on, a, on this PC, we don't have a full, it's not a virtual machine, it's a simulation. So we can open up a command prompt if we wanted to. And I can use commands that like on this computer, like I would use on any other computer, okay? So IP config slash all shows me the IP address configuration of this computer, which it has nothing. So I could actually now go to the config and just go in an easy way, 
instead of uh, it's set to static. So I might just set it to, just for today's purposes, DHCP. I'll go back to the desktop. I might just see if I see if I'm getting an IP address. Uh, yep, I'm getting an IP address now. It's a 169.254 IP address. And, and you'll learn that this is a special one. This is actually what's called an APIPA IP address. If you have a Windows computer and, there's, and you've set it to DHCP server to obtain the IP address from a DHCP server, and if there's no DHCP server on your network, it will give itself an IP address. That will always start with 169.254. If I see this on a real computer, I will have alarm bells going through my head. It would mean that the DHCP server on this network is not working. But for today, for this demonstration, not a big deal. I could easily also plug in, uh, plug in this IP address uh, settings. All right, so interface for RC for net. I can give it a static IP address, 192.168.20.101, for example. You might have seen this. You might have done something with IP addresses on your own computers. But before the end of this subject, you will definitely know exactly what all about IP addressing and what puts it, what makes it on the same network and what makes it on a different network. All right, so we've done that and we'll we'll do the same thing here. We'll go to config, we'll fast for now, we'll do a static 192.168.20.10, cause this is a server. Not that it has to be 10 to be a server, but just so I can just show you something. So I go here, I'm on my desktop. I go to my command prompt. I confirm what my IP address now is. I can see that's my IP address that I've configured. And if I look at the DHCP server, uh, if I look at the, that's a static IP address that I just configured. And if you, if you remember, I configured the server with a different static IP address, didn't I? 20.10. So I can use the same commands like ping to test connectivity. And you can see I've got a reply, which means, yes, they are there. What ping is, is diagnostic tool for, uh, what's it? Diagnosing network connectivity issues. If I'm getting a reply, it means that that person, that computer is responding to me. So that means my IP addressing and the network cabling and the configuration between me and that computer is all configured correctly. But if, it, if I'm not getting a reply, then something's not right. All right, so just so just for completion's sake, just on the real computer, for example, this is my live, uh, my physical computer. And you can see that I'm logged in as Alex Zhao. What I like to do a lot of times, just to test if there's a problem that is, someone's got problems with their network, I just can Google. And you can see I've got a reply. What this is telling me, just offhand, is that my computer is, being conf is configured correctly. The devices between me and Google, which includes the internet access and every device in between, is working and configured correctly. And also that, uh, that, uh, that uh, yeah, the ISP and all that is correct. Yep. I can, unless your firewall is blocking my, uh, my pings. So that's the other thing. You might have heard of the term firewall. Okay, firewall blocks and allow traffic. And by default, a Windows 10 computer blocks ping. Anyone want to guess why? Anyone want to guess why your computer might not respond to ping by default? Any guesses? Let, sorry? No, no, ping is just a small packet itself, okay? So what did you say? No, no, it's not connection timeout. It just doesn't reply. All right, I'll tell you why. I'll ask you a question. If you uh, were in Afghanistan right now and you weren't doing the right thing, do you want to be seen by the authorities? If you were in Ukraine, there was Russian soldiers all around you and you're not Russian, do you want to be seen by... The Russian soldiers? Probably not. Okay, I'll put it this way. If you have a computer, which is your home computer, you're connected to the internet. Do you want people on the internet to know you're there? No. No. I should use VPN. Yeah, you use VPN to hide where you are. 
and to but the, the firewall is blocking people from pinging you because if they can ping you, they know you're there. If they know you're there, then you're a target, aren't, aren't, aren't you? If they you don't reply to ping, then you, they don't know you're there. So why would they waste their time trying to do anything to you? You get me? It's like the stealth fighter jets. They're, they're, they're there to avoid detection. Okay? It's not like a tank where they're there to be seen and be intimidating. They, they want to hide themselves. So if they can't be seen, they can't be attacked. So your computer, if you have a Windows 10, by default, will, uh, if you have your firewall turned on, which you should, will not reply to ping. And hence, the attackers or baddies on the internet won't be able to see that you're there and won't use, uh, see you as a target. You get me? It's minor, but it's just something. All right. So basically, getting back to... Packet Tracer, we're not going to go too far. Later on in the next lesson, we're going to configure some of these, uh, configure some of these uh, devices, Cisco devices. For example, in a uh, config B and All right, so you can see that I've changed the host name from switch to Alex SW. Okay, so this is just changing the name of the host. But we'll learn all about a whole heap of other commands in the second lesson, some basic configuration, how to configure some of the things on these devices. These Cisco devices use what's called a Cisco IOS, Cisco operating system, if you like to think of it. And this operating system is on, a, uh, it's on all their devices. You can notice that's a switch. All right, that's a switch. This is a router. I think it's on now. Let's go to a command line interface. No. All right, so if I actually... The same, same command. And you can see I did exactly the same thing. Change the host name from router to Alex RT. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is once you learn the Cisco IOS commands, you can go to this device, that device, whatever device around the world, doesn't matter if it's uh, you know, in England or in uh, what's the Spain, they all have the same Cisco devices, same Cisco IOS, same commands. So that's why your CCNA certification, which as exam examines your skills and knowledge in these area means that you can take that CCNA, get a job anywhere in the world, not just in Australia. Okay, so that's enough for packet tracer for now. The key thing is it's a software, you want it, you want to download it, you want to install it on your home computer, and you're going to use it to practice, practice these commands, learn how to do these things because one of your final assessments is to come to class, take these cables, configure, uh, connect the switch, the router your PCs along the wall here to a network similar to that or more complicated. And then you, your, your assessment will ask you to go in and configure a whole bunch of things, including the IP address, including the routing protocols, and then it all has to work and you have to verify this with the ping utility. And I would have to go around and check that you've done everything correctly. And if you have, no problems, tick. Because I, I, like I said in the orientation or the enrollment events, we're here to train you to be able to get a job and do a job. Okay, so all these skills, the hands-on skills that you'll see that in your courses that you'll eventually be able to do a job, okay? So get this packet tracer, do the activities, the labs that we're gonna show you later on, and make sure you're proficient in these things because at the end of the day, the only person that's gonna help is you in getting a job and doing the job. All right, getting back to this, PowerPoint, so Packet Tracer. Here's a video of how to install Packet Tracer. I'm assuming most of you know how to install a piece of software if you've got the setup, a set of files, okay? Because if you don't, then you probably should be studying a cert three rather than cert four. All right, network components. So we sort of spoke about this briefly just, just then when I was doing my demonstration, but host roles. Every computer on the network has uh, is called a host or end device, okay? Servers are computers that provide information, okay? So file server has files that you can access, like our, our L drive or our IT studies NAS the other day that I showed you. A web server contains web pages, 
uh, email service exchanges your email between you and your friends and your people you want to communicate with. Clients are the computers that users usually sit at. They're the ones that the users use to input and access these servers, uh, whether they be email or websites. There's different types of networks. So at home, for example, you would have a peer-to-peer -peer network. And what does that mean? Peer means equal, okay? Peer-to-peer -peer means each of these computers at home are equal. They, they're usually not a specialized computer, I'm guessing, for your house. Or maybe you'll surprise me and say, oh, I've got a dedicated, uh, dedicated Active Directory server at home because I like to enforce security on all my users in my home network. Okay, great. But uh, I'm guessing the majority of us has a MBN or ADSL router. You have one or two computers, laptops, maybe the printer, maybe a media center, maybe a Chromecast or a, yeah, uh, what's a, a, you know, a ring doorbell, maybe even a smart fridge. But to be honest, all of those things are client sort of devices, okay? And they are all sort of equal. So that's what they're called a peer-to-peer -peer network. There's no dedicated specialized computer that does a function and no one sits at it or uses it directly. Okay, but in your subjects coming up next semester, definitely you'll be learning about uh, Microsoft Server and Linux and we'll actually create specialized computers which host services like Active Directory, uh, file and print sharing, et cetera, et cetera. So the thing about peer-to-peer -peer networks is that they're easy, they're cheap easy to configure because like, like at home you probably set up your wi-fi router gives out it gives an ip address you get your laptops or computer you join that wi-fi network and voila network done okay no specialized configuration or anything so it's easy to set up less complex lower costs and it's used for very simple tasks like transferring files sharing that printer accessing the internet etc okay but you probably don't have anything sophisticated but some of the disadvantages is that no centralized administration. What does that mean? You have to go to each of your computer to administer them one by one. If you've got five, not a, probably not a big deal. You probably you're probably already doing that for your family, your daughter, your friend, your uh, your your brother, sister. They probably have a problem with their computer. You just go on their computer and fix it up. Whereas in a in the next type of network, there will be specialized computers where you can do some of the administration from a single point by creating users. If you want a user account on each of that five computers we talked about at home, you probably have to go on each of those five computers and create a user account for yourself. Whereas if we're talking about a server with Active Directory, like we have at TAFE here, we have a server with Active Directory and all of your accounts are imported in when you registered and then it's created once in Active Directory. You can log on to any of these computers, the Wi-Fi network and basically everywhere that you need access with a username and password. The peer-to-peer -peer network is not as secure because each computer is responsible for each, uh, its own security. It's not scalable because once you get more than five, more than 10, it becomes crazy to administer, isn't it? If you had to, if you had to do, go on every computer to create a user account for yourself on five, not a big deal maybe, but just imagine you had 20, that you go to 20 devices to create the same user account. If you change your password, oh, I have to go to 20 devices and change the password. What if you had a thousand computers? What if you had more, 10,000 computers, like literally we do at TAFE? If you had to do that on every computer for every student in TAFE SA, you'll just, uh, it'll be crazy. So end devices. End devices is where the messages originate and where they go to. Okay, data originates with an end device, flows through the network, and arrives at another end device. Okay, so you got people here, you guys sitting on your computers. You've got uh, the switches, which basically every computer is connected to a switch or access point, basically same role. And you go through these things, which is in the internet called routers. Okay, and eventually you end up on another LAN. Let's say when I ping Google, they went from all of these things onto another LAN, and there was a server called Google there www.google.com, we pinged it, it replied and went back for the whole thing and went back to the user which pinged it, okay? 
All right, so intermediary devices. So we have, so end devices are the ones that users, uh, computer, people use, but intermediary devices are the things, devices that connects the networks together, okay? Uh, wireless routers, like you have at home, you could have multi-layer switches, you might have LAN switches, you have routers, firewall applications, and basically intermediary devices interconnects end devices, uh, management of data, it manages the data as it flows through these intermediary devices, for example, the router in this. Okay, in, sorry, the routers in this, uh, this diagram, these devices are routers. You can see there's multiple paths it can take to get to this area. The each line of, each one of these lines is a different path. So one of the jobs that the routers have to do is actually decide which path to take to get to the end device and hence the name routers. They take the route, or if you're more used to Australian English, the route to the destination. Okay, obviously Cisco is an American company, that's why they call routers rather than routers. Uh, but in, Australia, uh, in English here in Australia, we call route, okay? So if you have, um, if you want to drive to Melbourne, you might take route A, goes through Geelong, wherever. But if you want to go take a different route, you could go through uh, Mildura, go a different way to, to Melbourne. How do you decide? As a human being, easy. I want to see these things. Okay, no worries, we go that way. Or I know that that, that uh, freeway from Geelong to Melbourne is a very high traffic. Maybe I'll take a different way. But that's what the job of the router is, to determine the best path to send the next, send to the next. Uh, then we talk about network media. Like I said, there's a whole heap of things we're covering. Network media is basically how does the information flow? Is it through Ethernet cables? Okay, you can see these patch cables connect to the back of your computer to a, to a, port, uh, to a patch point on the wall, runs through these cables goes to a cabinet like this somewhere else, comes out of these patch ports, and then in the server room or telecommunication closet, they get plugged into a router, which then plugs into the rest of the network. But, but that's not the only way. You see those devices are up there? That one there? What's that? So Sorry? That's not no, that's not a router. It says Aruba on there, if you're wondering. What do you think that is? Okay, it's an AP or access point, okay? So access point is a Wi-Fi antenna, pretty much, and does the same job as this device does with the cables. But instead of using cables as the media, we're using radio frequencies or Wi-Fi. So that's where we're talking about the different types of media now. We have copper Ethernet cables. We have radio frequencies for Wi-Fi. Uh, wi we have fiber optics for long distance, long distance high bandwidth uh, connections. Like for example, you know, between between uh, you might have heard of the submarine cables in Fiji was cut or was one of the islands up there when they had a cyclone or something like that, and they were without internet for all this time, but they're all connected with these cables underneath the sea to Australia, to other places, and uh, basically uh, you would choose the right media for the right purpose. So what, uh, why would I choose wireless? Because it's flexible. I don't need to have a cable. I can have a laptop. I can move this laptop anywhere in this building and I still get network access. It's very flexible, isn't it? What's the downside? The downside is actually it's radio frequency. And if you have a source of interference, like other radios, it could interfere into that uh, communication. It's uh, using the same, or if you all had laptops, for example, we'll be using the same access point, the same bandwidth. So we would have actually have to split that bandwidth between us. Okay. Um, what about copper? Copper is relatively cheap. It's easy to work with, easy to use. But I can tell you now, copper has a maximum cable length of 100 meters, which is fine for most situations like at home. But if we're going 
across this campus, that 100 meters is not enough. So then we have to have devices in between. And also, <clears throat> uh, copper is also subjective to uh, EM radiation. You heard of that, electromagnetic interference, EMI. All right, so for example, if you have a large motor in a, in a factory, for example, that's, you're making, yeah, let's say cardboard, but these giant motors are spinning around making the cardboard machine work, uh, all of those will have big giant magnets in there, electro, uh, electric magnets, and each of those will radiate out this electromagnetic field. And if you have your cable too close to one of those things, all the data you're sending is going to be corrupted. Okay, you can get shield, shielding for it, of course, but uh, in a situation like that, it's uh, better not to use uh, copper and probably it's not good to use wireless either, uh, but fiber. Fiber optics is not susceptible to electric magnetic interference, but it's very expensive, hard to work with. You need a special license to even just make a cable and terminate your cable. You have to polish it to a, such a degree that it actually lets the light trans, uh, cross from one to another without any distortion because it's actually using light to bounce its way through this glass cable and once it gets to the other end, the, the other device will interpret those signals. So, so where do we use what? So that's basically something we're going to talk about and that's something that's going to be your assignment. Topologies. <clears throat> Topology representation. You can see that in the in the uh, packet trace we had these icons. So these are sort of end devices, uh, computers, laptops, IP phones, wireless tablets. Nothing too, nothing too uh, strenuous there. You guys should be all familiar with these end devices because that's the stuff you use. These intermediary devices you may not be familiar with. Everyone should be familiar with a wireless router. That's what you have at home. But what about a multi-layer switch, a LAN switch, firewall, or router? Probably not so much. And that's what we're here to teach you, okay, in this course and many other courses. And these are sort of the different symbols for media. This is LAN media. This is wireless media. WAN media usually by this uh, serial connection. But the key thing is uh, you can recognize it. Okay, for example, in this diagram, you can see that the, there's, a, there's a web server, email server, these are server icons, these are end devices. You can see that this is using a straight through cable, Ethernet cable, just because it's black, <laughs> it's a straight line, uh, and it's plugged into a switch, and this switch, which is uh, called S5, is plugged into this router, which then connects it to the rest of the other networks, and then to the internet as well. So this router is sort of the central hub, isn't it? Everything is feeding off this router. So if I was this computer in classroom free and I wanted to talk to the web server here, I would have to go through my switch, which just connects everything together. It doesn't do much at all. It just connects everything together. But then in order to get to the web server, I must go to this router and the router must decide that the, uh, the web server is actually on the server room network and put it, send it out of this interface and get to the web server. So this is where the decision making is made. Why is it not going to send it out of this interface or that interface or this interface? Because the destination is not on those networks. Each one of these interfaces off the router is a different network. And this router connects different networks together. All right. And becomes your gateway for your network. You heard of the term default gateway? Maybe. Maybe not. Let's let's go to our real command prompt. So if I go on my real computer, I do an IP config. And if I look at this one, which is the Adelaide.tfsa.edu Ethernet adapter, you can see I've got an IP address, but I also got a default gateway. That default gateway is effectively the router. If I if I'm if I'm this device. That default gateway is basically this router's interface here. Okay, so look at this room. You're stuck in this room, aren't you? 
you want to get out of this room, you must go through that doorway. If we look at this diagram, that doorway is effectively this router that lets you get everywhere else. Okay, so a router, that's why it's called a gateway, gateway doorway, allows your computer to talk to other computers on other networks. Okay, so this is what a physical network looks like. Okay, this is what a physical network looks like, and this is how it physically it's connected up. But if you look at this, this is what the logical network looks like. And if you look at these, these, this, these computers are sort of in a circle. These ones are in a circle. Each one of these are in a, its own little area, meaning they're all different networks. So log, uh, physically, they're connected like this in a physical room. So here, they're in the, in the, in the, in the various racks in the shelf one, shelf two, shelf three. But effectively, these uh, these computers are in a different physical room, like these computers here. But when you look at it in a logical way, how they're organized, they're really organized. Even though they're in different physical rooms, the the switch and the uh, the computer here are on the same network. Whereas even though these switches are in the same room, but because they're connected to different interface, interfaces of the router, they're on separate networks. So where you're physically located sometimes does not have any relevance to which network you belong to. <laughs> All right, the common types of networks. You have your different size networks, like I said, you've got your home, that's a perfect example. It's a small home network. Um, you, you might have, you might know some people who work uh, and do business out of their home. And that's, it's a small office or home office type network. And as we're getting bigger, you might have medium or large networks. And uh, and you might have worldwide networks. So this medium large network is probably something equivalent to TFSA, where we have uh, many locations, but all in the same state, really. But if you have a worldwide network, you might have a company called Google that has servers everywhere around the world, no, a lot of places. Not maybe not everywhere, but a lot of work, a lot of places. So you can have networks of different sizes. So we have LANs and WANs. LAN stands for local area network. That's what we on. A LAN is where it's all under the same control of the same company or administrator. So even though this TAFE SA has many sites, each one of them is a different LAN. But the difference, uh, but the, the the area that connects them together which is the which is the internet is what we call the WAN, the wide area network. So look at this. If we have TFSA LA campus, TFSA, TFSA Norlunga, TFSA Mount Gambia, but they're all connected through the internet to the internet and to each other. So this area is the LAN, this area is the WAN. If you like to think of it, WAN is basically the internet. Okay? Area that you don't control. <clears throat> okay, LAN, the interconnected end devices is in a limited area. <clears throat> it's administered by a single organization or individual, and usually the connections are very high bandwidth. If you think about it, each of these computers plugged into a typical everyday switch now, it's probably gigabit. That's a thousand megabits per second. Let me ask you guys, your home network, your connection to the internet, what speed is that? Huh? Yeah. Oh, so 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 you went to TPG and got a gigabit connection, did you? Huh? So we we'll say that again. All right. So let's go. Oh, oops. Uh, that's um. Um. I'm. Uh, let's go here. So let's go to TPG. Let's have a look at the typical TBG. Uh, high speed ambience. Let's put in uh, what's it? Oh, 
Uh, yes, so someone in the chat saying 50-20, view the MBM plans. Let's have a look. So if we look at this, this is max speed of is about 20 megabits per second. Okay, so when we're talking about here in the LAN, we're talking about each one of these computers individually is getting gigabit connection, a thousand. And the top tier here is about 50 uh, megabits per second. Okay, download. And that's for your internet connection for your whole, whole home. Meaning, if you've got 10 people in that home and they're all using the internet, they have to split that up in 10 ways, don't they? So what am I really getting at? So the LAN is usually very fast, high speed. And the WAN is typically slow, a lot slower than what you get in the LAN. <clears throat> the, LAN uh, the WAN connects LANs over a wide geographic area and it's typically administered by many, many people, whoever's in charge of a section of the network. Okay. You, even just going from here to Google, I'm pro probably passing through a lot of different ISPs, uh, different routers along the way. The internet, the internet is a worldwide collection of interconnected LANs and WANs, and LANs are connected to each other using WANs, and WANs may use copper wires, fiber optic cables, wireless transmission. There's so many different ways. Okay, you're probably aware more of these than I am. Uh, the internet is not owned by any individual or group, but it's the following groups are sort of uh, developed the main structure to help the structure. So that's uh, IETF, ICA, WN, IAB. And to be honest, do I need to know these things? Not really. If I want to do the Cisco exam, maybe, but to pass this subject today, tomorrow, not really. Okay. It's one of those information, if I really need to look it up, I'll look it up. To pass the assignments, I might look it up, but I don't need to know off my heart, off the top of my head every day. Uh, intranet and extranet. So intranet is only within your company. Uh, extranets are sort of in between. You got internal, uh, internal users and external users, but these users which are external are sort of you know of them. So if you like to think of it, think of our file server that's on the campus, they're intranet servers. Okay? So we access the L drive, get the files, the intranet. Think of your Learn and your Office 365. They're sort of our services, but we provide the, them to you who are our collaborators or customers, and you can access them from home not just on the TAFSA campus. So these are those type of services. Then you've got the internet, which is really for the public and I don't really care who you are. You can go there anonymously unless you want to then do something that requires login. Think of your TAFSA website where you got the course information initially. Internet connections, there's many ways of connecting. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of the different types of things now. Just suffice to say there's cable, DSL, cellular, your 4G, 5G, uh, your dial-up, if anyone still uses dial-up. But satellite, that's something that's uh, getting more more and more prevalent. You heard, of, you guys heard of the Starlink? Maybe? Yeah? So you probably heard of Elon Musk. Okay, so he's pretty famous. He's got that, he's launched all these little tiny little satellites around orbit, around the world, and instead of actually, it's alternative to and to giving you the like for example a lecturer here lives in the country and they have really bad internet so but with the starlink assuming that it's in the good area and they don't have any disruptions they're getting really decent internet speeds in the country okay that, and obviously you don't have infrastructure everywhere around the world but with the starlink uh, i think even in ukraine uh he shipped off all these things to ukraine as a donation to give them internet access still um and i think his plan is to uh i think he's developing a model phone okay and then that is becomes a phone that you use with the starlink and then people switch from using their typical everyday phones to this phone and he makes him more money okay so don't get angry just buy some shares business connectivity so at home you might have all uh 
those type of connections that we spoke about just before. But for a business, for example, you could have what's called dedicated lease lines, which means instead of actually uh, sharing this line, uh, sharing this connection, like uh, with everyone else that's in the area, you actually have a dedicated lease line from your organization to your ISP. But trust me, that's very, very expensive. Okay, I think I inquired or found out just to get a direct uh, lease line, dedicated lease line from this side of Curry Street to the other side of Curry Street, which is just one street, it's about 20,000 just to get the line, then there's ongoing costs as well. So that's why a lot of people don't have dedicated lines now and just use what's called VPN. Someone said VPN before, but we use VPN to connect individually to our organizations, but also between different uh, locations of our organization. So there's all that ones as well. So in the past, we used to have computer network, we used to have telephone network, we used to have satellite broadcast network. Have you noticed that? Like in the past, we had a TV antenna, we tune a TV. Uh, we used to have a telephone system where we plug in a number and then it goes through a telephone exchange and we connect to the other number. But these days, it's all converging. Okay, if you haven't noticed on your phone, for example, you might have, I don't even know where my phone is, it's probably on my desk. You might have this symbol that says Wi-Fi calling. Okay, yeah, have you seen that? Okay, so Wi-Fi calling, that's actually a common thing now. So even your 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 phone providers is taking advantage of the fact you got Wi-Fi and using that. So all of these devices, your phone with IP telephony, your Wi-Fi calling, uh, your streaming yeah, media, for example, I don't need a TV antenna now. I don't think I've used my TV antenna in the last couple of years because everything I can watch on TV that's through the antenna, I can watch online. For example, I want to watch what, uh, Channel 9, what's happening right now. I just use the 9 app. You can watch live TV, couldn't you? You don't even have to watch the one that's for Adelaide. You can watch the Sydney news if you're that more interested in that. So the conversion network means that everything all these different networks, data, voice, video, whatever, is all going to use the same network, which is what we're seeing now. What does that mean? That means these networks has to be more robust and able and capable of handling all the load that's on it. So we need reliable networks, and we'll talk more about this in every part of IT. Obviously, we've got fault tolerance, so you shouldn't have one single point of failure. So if you're relying on these infrastructures for all these things. If that one single thing that it was the it was like yeah holding your uh, network together fails, and you don't have anything that's redundant, then every, all of those services go down, no, doesn't it? Your business, yourself, your home entertainment comes to a crashing halt. So what fault tolerance means that you can tolerate faults if you reverse it. So it usually means instead of having one or something, you have multiple. Instead of having one hard drive that fails, you might have a RAID system with multiple hard drives. Instead of having one internet connection for your business, because it's important to us, we might have redundant connection. Even at home, I think a lot of you guys, if you get a Telstra connection or something like that, you have the main MBN. But if it goes out, you have a 4G, 5G backup in some of your, your cases. Okay. The scalability as well. Scalability means you can grow bigger and bigger without having to redesign your whole infrastructure. Just imagine, oh, I have to plug another 10 computers in. Oh, we have to now recreate our whole network. That's not ideal. Scalable network or scalable infrastructure means that I am able to plug more in because it's modular. So you know how we had these uh, diagrams uh, back here somewhere. So we had these diagrams here. If we need another classroom, can we just add another switch? Add more interfaces to this router or have more routers? And if I need another 10 classrooms, can I just keep on expanding like that? So that's what I'm talking about. When you're designing something, you've got to design it to be modular and scalable. And when you have provisioning devices, Cap, uh, like servers and even your internet connection, even your uh, your uh, devices like routers and switches, uh, you have to make sure they can be they can grow. 
you know how I pointed out that pay as you grow thing in one of the data sheets right at the beginning when we're looking at the support file? In your assignment, you're going to be asked, what is pay, to, pay as you grow? Basically, you buy devices, which is capable of a million things, but you pay, uh, pay Cisco this much if you only need this much capacity of it. So you, it's a bit like uh, it's a bit like unlocking the features of your device. So your device might be capable of like 10 megabits per second, but if you pay this license, you might only get a thousand megabits, a gigabit. But you pay as you grow, as the name suggests. If you need that extra, whatever 10, 10 gigabits, for example, you pay more, and you unlock that that part of it. Some people disagree with this because obviously it means that you're paying for hardware that you can't actually use. You might have heard of some cars doing that now. Okay, so like for example, the Tesla again, uh, t Tesla Autopilot. It's on. It's built in. It's software. But if you want it, you have to pay for a subscription. You know what I mean? It's already your car's already capable of it. It's just that unless you pay Elon uh, his money, you're not going to get the Autopilot. For example, you get it for free to try. But you don't get it if you don't pay. So, so basically, scalability could be unlocking those features. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's probably uh, him. But like, I'm just saying, the traditional person who buys a car, if it's a V8, it's a V8. Um, you're going to get all the performance uh, measures of it. But there's talk about you paying extra to unlock some performance of some cars. You're paying some places uh, if you want heated seats. It's got heated seats, physical hardware. But if you want to unlock that thing, you pay a twenty dollars subscription a month. You get me? So, if from a car company, yeah, definitely makes sense. I, I it's can... not the same with the switches. Like the pay yeah, no, it's, it's, it is. That's yeah. exactly right. That's what I'm saying. It is. It's absolutely it is. That's what the pay as you grow is. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. I'm equiv equiv equating it to some of these features that's coming in the cars even. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that you can get some of these top end hardware cheaper because you know you don't you don't necessarily need a performance, but you could have it built in, but you just don't get access to it until you need it, until you pay for it. So you don't go back and buy a new device because you suddenly need this extra bandwidth. You just have to pay more to Cisco to unlock that bandwidth that's already there, which makes it scalable. Really, it's not redesigning the network, replacing every device. You're just unlocking a feature with this licensing model. Okay, here it does. Uh, it's just debatable whether you know, it's profiteering or not profiteering, depending on your point of view. There's, uh, there's pros and cons with all these things. There's also quality of service. So you'll learn that in the future that we can prioritize different types of traffic. For example, remember we talked about converging networks just before, where you got your email, we got your TV streaming, we've got your uh, phone calls. Let me ask you a question. If you were reading an email and your email took an extra couple of seconds to load, would that change your life or would that make you upset? Probably not. Okay. But if you're on a phone call and there was a five second lag every time you said something before they heard it, would that be very annoying after a bit? Definitely. I've had situations like that where people, uh, I moved on to the next thing, but they haven't heard my previous thing. It's very confusing. So quality of service allows us to prioritize, let's say the voice over the data, like for example, web, e uh, web, email, stuff like that. Okay, because the voice, it matters, but loading the web page or loading the email, not so much. There's obviously security built in. So these days, uh, security is a giant, giant, big concern because of all the hackers and stuff like that. So everything has to be secured. Networking trends. So basically, a lot of the trends include, you probably, these are not even trends anymore, they're probably commonplace. Uh, BYOD. Okay, bring your own device. Uh, did anyone bring their laptop to school today? If you did, you could access our Wi Fi with your TAFE account and you, do your work on there. Um, online collaboration. So the guys online. Would uh, would already know that we're doing this online collaboration as we speak, okay? So there's a couple of people, ten of you online. We're collaborating online and in person here. Uh, video communication, very common to have Teams calls or even yeah FaceTime and stuff like that. 
cloud computing. I mentioned that the other day, you'll be doing a subject in the next term called, uh, uh, what's it, the Amazon Web Services Cloud Foundations. And instead of having servers on, on campus or on site, you have it in the cloud. We mentioned that sort of in the virtualization part the other day. All right, so technology trends at home, smart homes, your fridge, that can actually send you a live feed of what's in your fridge. Okay, uh, my, my cousin, again, uh, uh, that's why I know a little bit about the Tesla cars and stuff like that. My cousin just bought a Tesla car and he's also got a building a new home and he's got solar and his, uh, car, his solar is charging up a battery, probably a Tesla Powell, it's a Tesla fan, fan, fan. And uh, then at night where he parks his car there, he goes on his phone and he checks that the power wall is charging his car. So all of those means connected. Everything's connected, okay? At home, we've got smart doorbell, got cameras, got like uh, the Google Home Nest to, uh, to, to view what, who's at the front door. Yeah, people deliver things. You can communicate with them at the front door and stuff like that. So, and lights that you can turn on and off just even when you're in yeah, Thailand or Bali, just so you people can think you're home or something like that. Uh, but all of these things means everything. You might have heard of these. These are not really great. There's power line networks. You can buy special devices that allows your computer to send signals through the power line that's existing in your house. Okay, that's not ideal. It's not, not really the best. I'm not even sure why anyone will really use it but it's just another way of connecting your LAN. A wireless broadband. So, yeah, so that's, um, that's uh, been around a little bit uh, for a while. It's uh, in LA, we've got uh, YMAX. You might've heard of that. You might've heard of, uh, what was that other company that's always around? I can't figure it out this time, but they provide uh, wireless broadband, okay? so. Uh, in addition to DSL cable, wireless is another option. Network security. So we have security threats coming everywhere. Okay. We spoke, we briefly spoke about firewalls. You see this, this brick wall that represents a firewall. So this internet <laughs> connects to our internal network. It usually goes through a firewall. Usually as an administrator of this, fire, administrator of this firewall, if it's TFSA firewall or your home firewall, you control what is allowed in and what's not. Remember how we talked about the ping? If you allow any, if you, the general rule is if you have anything open running that you don't need, it's an opportunity for someone to take advantage of it. Okay. Think about your house as a whole. If you've got no windows, one door, it's a lot harder to break in than a house with 20 windows and six doors. Obviously, because if you had 20 windows and six doors, any, if any one of those windows or doors is left open or ajar, then they could break it. So we in IT call this the surface area of attack. The more services you have running, the more ports you have open, the more opportunity that an attacker could use one of those ports or services to compromise your system. It might not even be a big thing that you left open because uh, you've left open, but that might be the way they get in. It's what they do afterwards. So security, uh, security uh, concerns could come from the internet generally. There, there could also be internal threats. People who actually are in your network itself. So it's easy to see the I uh, see the threat coming from our side. You block everything, you lock everything up. But what if they already have access? What if I was a lecturer, I was just gone rogue, and I go on to the L drive and delete everything? I could, couldn't I? And all of our classes would be disrupted because their files won't be there. I could go in and delete all the assessments uh, that you guys have sat and cause problems big time. So you sort of can't protect against a letter gone rogue doing that but what you can do is set up things that means that if they do it you can identify that so they even though they've got the powers to do all that kind of stuff they can't just do it and sort of get away with it and say oh who was that i don't know who knows might have been bob down there you can set up what's called auditing 
on access. So what does that mean? Keeps the people with power honest. If I go in and delete a file and suddenly that file is missing, they can go back through the auditing logs and the person who deleted it, that file, is you. So what can you do? Uh, what, what, you, what do you have to say for yourself? All right, external threats include viruses, worms, Trojan horses, spyware, zero day attacks. Zero day attacks are basically things that have no history. Okay, it's very hard to protect against zero day attacks because basically there's no no one's seen this before. Okay, uh, whereas uh, spyware, viruses, and worms and Trojan horses, they're talking about ones that have already been discovered. If there's a zero day worm or zero day virus, your antivirus is useless because they have no signature for it. Uh, threat actors, the people who actually do the bad things. You can have threat actors, which are just like an everyday person. Could be state-sponsored, like you probably heard of the term. Uh, these countries are, are getting these hackers to sort of do sort of, uh, sort of uh, cyber war against other countries. Okay. That's, that's those ones. There's denial of service attacks where they don't even want to gain access. They just want to prevent your, tip, uh, what's it, your, legitimate users from accessing your services. Um, there's data interception and theft. So if you send something through the internet, they could grab it, read it, maybe steal that information if it's important. Let's say you're doing some online banking and you're not using any secure protocols. I can, I can grab that and look at exactly what's in it. There's internal threats, like I mentioned. There's lost or stolen devices. That's like, yeah, that's uh, those kind of things. Uh, but you usually have an asset register and you actually allocate assets to people and they ultimately become responsible for that. There's accidental misuse by employees. So that's sometimes you accidentally did the wrong thing. And there's deliberate people like that and make sure they're gone rogue, like I mentioned before. Security solutions. So obviously we should all be aware of the fact that we should have an antivirus, firewall, and probably some intrusion detection on our computers. Unfortunately, for most of us, if we're using Windows operating system, it comes with the Windows Defender, which is all of the free. Uh, people can argue if it's good or bad, but that's, that's not my concern here. But the fact is, you need to keep them up to date. It doesn't matter what you have, if they're not up to, updated, if your operating system not patched and updated, then you're probably leaving your door open for all these people to attack you. Um, so you, so if you're at home, that's fine. Uh, so if you're at home, that's fine. But if you're at, if you're at work, like here, the corporate network, you probably have a dedicated firewall system that protects the computers in here from the internet baddies. You have what's called access control list to give different levels of access to different people. For example, the L drive, I could delete it as a lecturer, lecturer but you guys probably can't. There's intrusion prevention systems, which actually detect the type of traffic that's going through our network and identify whether they are legitimate or not legitimate traffic. There's VPNs, I mentioned VPNs before, but there's uh, VPNs to your company that actually keep your connections from home or from another place uh, secret. All right, so that's the end of today's presentation. Mm -hmm.